Thank you very much, Mr. Organizers, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I have no financial interest to disclose in this presentation. I've been asked to cover the subject of Coats disease versus retinoblastoma. And I'll begin by asking the audience a question. Which one of these children has retinoblastoma and which has Coats disease? The older girl or the younger boy? We'll answer the question later. And which of these two is Coats disease with a retinal detachment and which is retinoblastoma? They do have many similarities. But the differentiation of these two entities is very important in order to provide better patient care and also for medical legal repercussions. I think that this may be only second to ROP suits in this disease, pediatric ophthalmology. I'd first like to show a couple of illustrated cases that stress that point. For example, a nine, several years ago, a nine-year-old boy was sent in with leukocoria elsewhere. He was treated elsewhere for Coats disease with photocoagulation, cryotherapy, two sclerobuckles, vitrectomy, and finally came to a nucleation. It was interesting that there was a change in hospital personnel at that time, and the eye was left in formaldehyde and not looked at. And after six months, the patient came back with protrusion of the implant, a temporal hemianopsia in the opposite eye, marked chemosis, and the CT showed them orbital mass behind the implant, extending back to the chiasm. This, the eye was then retrieved and studied histopathologically, and there was retinoblastoma with optic nerve extension. This child died of systemic complications and metastasis, and being curious about that case, I wrote to the original doctors elsewhere and said, did you get any fundus photographs back when the diagnosis of Coates disease was made? And they sent them, and here's what arrived. This is not Coates disease. This is a mass of diffuse material with a snowball in the vitreous. And as I said, this child died of brain extension. Coates disease doesn't look like that. Another patient perhaps was more fortunate. A male consultation was sent in from a very prominent uh, ophthalmologist who said, we have a patient with Coates disease and we want to ask, how would you manage this? Drain the subretinal fluid? Should we do the vitrectomy or what? In looking at this photograph, we were able to tell the doctor, uh, don't do any vitreous surgery and nucleate the eye. Why? Because that vessel going off the disc and dipping in and disappearing is quite different from retinoblastoma, from Coates disease. We recommended a nucleation, it was done, and this was indeed a retinoblastoma. And I could cite quite a number of other cases where there have been serious medical legal repercussions in making this differentiation. So the purpose of the next few minutes is to elucidate some of the clinical features that might be helpful to you as a clinician in differentiating Coates disease from retinoblastoma. We, we have over 1,400 cases with retinoblastoma, over 200 now with Coates disease, and they've had very thorough evaluations with fundus drawings and other appropriate studies. Factors that are possibly helpful in the differentiation are age, gender, family history, and laterality. But these are not highly reliable because there's a lot of overlap in all these conditions. The more reliable features that you can see as a clinician include the clinical findings. And these include the nature of the pupillary reflex, the nature of the anterior chamber, the clarity of the vitreous, color and the subretinal fluid, caliber and course of the retinal vessels, and the macular appearance. So which of these two has retinoblastoma and Coates disease? The girl, it's hard to see, but if you look carefully, has more of a yellow reflex from the pupil. We call that xanthochoria as opposed to the boy who has more of a white reflex, leukocoria, which is retinoblastoma. The anterior chamber in both conditions can produce an iris neovascularization, secondary glaucoma, and hyphema. But when the anterior chamber is involved with pure Coates disease, one sees anterior chamber cholesterolosis, whereas in retinoblastoma, the anterior chamber might show the pseudohypopion with the snowballs on the iris margin, as you see here. The vitreous is also important. In untreated Coates disease, the vitreous is almost always clear, and you can see the underlying pathology. Whereas in the endophytic type of retinoblastoma, the vitreous is not clear. There's a hazy view. The subretinal material is also important. In Coates disease, it's a yellow or yellow-green color, 
Whereas in retinoblastoma, at least the exophytic type, it's a gray-white color. This produces the xanthochoria and the leukochoria that I mentioned earlier. The caliber of the retinal blood vessels is different as well. In Coats disease, the vessels are dilated, but they're not uniformly dilated. There's irregular sausage-like dilatation, and in retinoblastoma, the vessel is uniformly dilated without the telangiectasia. The distribution of the blood vessel is also different. In Coats disease, if you follow them, the blood vessels go all the way across the retina and do not generally disappear, whereas in retinoblastoma, they take a dip and disappear into the lesion. The macular changes are also important. When children with Coats disease are sent in with leukochoria, you generally see this yellow exudation in the fovea that can produce the pupillary reflex. Whereas in retinal, note there's, there's no feeder vessels to that exudation. Whereas in retinoblastoma, you'll see a white tumor in the posterior pole with a dilated feeding artery and draining vein. Ancillary studies can also be helpful in addition to your ophthalmoscopy. Ultrasonography, of course, which should be done in the office on these kids, shows a total retinal detachment pattern with Coats disease and a tumor pattern with calcification with retinoblastoma. And the fluorescein can also be helpful. In Coats disease, you can delineate these telangiectasias, irregular vessels, whereas in retinoblastoma, they're more uniformly dilated. So in summary, there's a great number of differences in the clinical appearance of these entities. You can look at the pupillary reflex, think of the anterior chamber, determine the clarity of the vitreous, the color of the subretinal fluid, the course and caliber of the retinal vessels, and the macular appearance. And even though people will sometimes look at a kid and say, leukocoria, it could be retinoblastoma or Coats, if you keep these factors in mind, it'll really be helpful to you in your diagnosis. And we know now that Coats disease and retinoblastoma are indeed similar. You don't have to rush to an exam under anesthesia every time first because the diagnosis can be made in your office. They have distinct differences in most cases, and it's very important to make the correct diagnosis so that you can initiate proper treatment for better care of your patients, but also, Lord forbid, many of the medical legal repercussions that have occurred in failure to make this differentiation. Thank you.